turn it upside down You made it right And I see it clearly Walking on a tightrope Walking with the blindfold Sometimes that's what it feels like Sometimes that's what it feels like Standing on a clear top Hoping that I won't die Sometimes that's what it feels like Sometimes that's what it feels like But I'd rather lose it all, it all, it all Than to see and never change Love is worth the risk Love is worth the risk Church, it's wonderful to have you with us today. God is in this place, so let's stand to our feet and let's worship our God with our voices and with our hearts. Open lost at the fall 
running away when I'd hear you call. But Father, you worked your will. I had no righteousness of my own. I had no right to draw near your throne. But Father, you loved me still. And in love before you laid the world's foundation. You predestined to adopt me as your own. You have raised me up so high above my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves it is the gift of God not by works so that nobody can boast God shows us grace when he answers our prayers and he works in our lives it is only through grace that we can be saved through God's favour when we are saved we are given victory over sin and death our God is good He's faithful, He's forgiving, He's gracious, strong, perfect and loving. The grace or favour He bestows on us is undeserved and our only response should be to want to worship and adore Him. Oh, how great is our God. Let's praise Him now. Think about these words and just adore the Lord. He deserves our praise. While I am lost in wonder, this love is like no other. I can't contain how good you are. Your grace beyond all measure, capture my heart forever. I'll never know how deep, how far. Worship. 
Hi everyone, welcome to church. My name is Vincent, and I am the pastor of the Chinese congregation here in City Ridge, Ogden. Thanks for joining us today. We've got some great things happening here at church, so let's check out what's coming up. Our prayer vision community night for term four is happening next Wednesday the 19th of October at 7 p.m. in the church cafe. Here, we'll hear from our elders and staff about our plans for 2023. We'll have a chance to pray together as a family and enjoy some delicious food and coffee. PPC is such an important event in our church, so don't miss out. On Sunday, the 23rd of October, we'll dedicate our Operation Christmas Child Shoe Boxes to the Lord in our morning services. From here, they will be sent to the group of children who are in need of daily supplies and the powerful love and presence of Jesus. Are you new to Sidridge Ogden? We would love to invite you to our welcome lunch, which will be held on Sunday, the 30th of October, straight after our 11 a.m. service. Here, you will meet some of our church staff and have a chance to learn about how you can become a part of the life of our church. We would love to see you there. So register at the information desk today or by calling the church office this week. 
。今天是我们的夫妻，也可以来到我们的中间。愿神祝福你。It's such a blessing to gather together today. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great week. 
we had a lot of people pull this together. So to get this to happen, there were so many people that either came and volunteered their time during the week, they may have helped beforehand, they may have donated stuff for us to be able to use for the week. So if you helped with KDC in any way, shape or form, even if it was just five minutes or the whole week, can you please stand up for us? If you helped in any way, you lent us anything that we belonged to us, you cooked for us, you helped, you came and played in the band. Can we give these people a huge round of applause, please? Thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, I also need to say a huge thank you to Caroline and Nancy, who also put in a massive effort to put KDC together as well. <laughs> Caroline, thankfully, is on holidays at the moment, so she couldn't be here. So she literally got on a plane straight after KDC um, to get out of here, I think. Um, so... That was really awesome to see how amazing that week was. Um, not only did we have a really fun time, but we also had three kids that dedicated their life to Christ, which is amazing. So can we give that a round of applause? Because that's pretty awesome. And we have a couple of kids here that are going to be sharing with us. So can I invite Elijah and Charlotte up? Come on down. Give them a huge round of applause. Come stand maybe off to the side here so everyone can see. So I'm going to ask you guys a few questions about KDC, and you can tell me what you think. Let's start with you, Elijah. What was your favorite part about KDC? Yeah, the drama was really good, and the worship was also very nice as well. So we had a pirate band of pirates that Jeremy was leading for us with their pirate costumes and hats, which was pretty awesome. And we had a, a drama, which I think was probably the most epic thing I've ever seen, of uh, the C team. So it was a bit of a, a spoof on the A team, and they were called the C team, S-E-A team, the C team. Um, and they, there were four people that explored the deep depths of the ocean to find Hookbeard's lost treasure, and that was pretty cool. Um, and what was your favorite thing about KDC, Charlotte? The C team as well. The C team. Anything else you got there about your favorite things? Well, why is that? Because it was really funny, and Jeremy really wanted his ponies back. He wanted his My Little Ponies back, yeah. <laughs> and I had to look for Captain Hook's lost treasure at the center of the earth. That was pretty impressive. And what are some things that you maybe learned from the Bible lessons that we did or the teaching that Mark and Heidi were sharing? Yeah, that Jesus is king and he's the ruler of our lives. Yeah, and what about you, Charlotte? That Jesus walked on water and Jonah got spat out of the way and we made a thing that had to spit out Jonah. Yeah, one of the activities we also did was we had a, a whale and the, the kids had to, to shoot Jonah as far out of the whale as he could because he'd been in the whale for three days and, you know, that's what happened, right? Very biblical. Um, and we're going to say our memory verse, so hopefully you can remember it together, okay? It's, where, where, do you remember where it's from? What was the, the book that it comes from? Do you want to help her out? Ephesians 3.18. Okay, we're going to say it together. And if you remember the actions, that's even better. You ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Grasp how wide and long and high and deep is Christ's love. Awesome. Give these guys a round of applause. Thank you, guys. You can go take a seat. So as you can see, we had lots and lots of fun. We did lots of amazing things. It was pretty awesome. Um, the other thing that I want to share with you guys is we are in kids' ministry. We run a program called Bedrock, and this is a weekly program that happens on a Thursday during the school term. And Mark Marno, um, who is one of our parents, who is also one of the people who was teaching up the front with Heidi, who's also here at KDC, Mark helps run um, this program called Bedrock. He came to me and said, I really want to run an after-school Bible club for kids because that is how... He himself got saved as a kid, and he's really, really passionate about it. And so I said, this is awesome. Let's do it. And so we consistently, since the start of the year, have had 30 kids come along each week. Hearing God's Word, we've been going through um, Genesis. We've been going through um, some stories from Jesus' life. We've been going through Peter, which is actually what we're going to be learning about today as well in our sermon, which is pretty cool. And we had... Uh, again, one kid who put, dedicated their life to Christ through that program, a school kid here at Cedar, which is really, really amazing. And that has been a, a real pleasure to be a part of, to be able to minister to these kids and just really speak Jesus' truth into their life. Um, so if you see Mark and you know Mark around the place, please encourage him. Please just give him um, yeah, a word of encouragement to say that he's doing an awesome job because he, he really is so passionate about wanting to see kids come to Christ. And that really is evident through Bedrock and through the work that he did at KDC with Heidi as well. Um, 
at church here is also a privilege for us to be able to um, give the money that God has blessed us with back to Him. And the way that we, we do here that, that at City Reach is through offering, and we give that money back to not only the ministries of this church, but that money goes towards furthering His kingdom, not just locally, but also um, in our state, in our uh, globally as well, with other City Reach churches. And it's a great way for us to be able to worship God with the things that He's blessed us with. And to be able to give back the things that really honestly don't belong to us, the things that God has given us, we should give back to Him. Um, and it's a way that we can glorify Him and honor Him as well. So if you've come prepared today to give in person, you can do that out in the foyer at the welcome desk, or you can also give online. I'm just going to finish by praying as we uh, get the band up to sing another song. Lord, I just want to thank you for the amazing work that you're doing through this kids' ministry, Lord. There are so many great, awesome uh, things that you have done. Um, there are uh, four kids that have given their life to you over the past couple of weeks, Lord, and we just praise you for that. We just pray that you keep them and bless them and protect them as they navigate what it means to follow you uh, every day of their life, Lord. Um, I just thank you for all of the, the volunteers who worked tirelessly for KDC and those that are involved with Bedrock as well, Lord. You've done an amazing work through them, and I just pray that you can bless them and give them the rest that they need to recover from such a big week. I just thank you and praise you, Lord, for the, for the beautiful weather that you're starting to bless us with, all the, the amazing sunshine that's really, really great to have, and especially for that great weather that we had over KDC as well. That was such a blessing to us. Um, I just thank you as well for the things that you have blessed us with, the money that you've given us, the roof over our heads, and I just pray that we can give that back to you um, to bring glory to your name and all that you're doing through City Reach. Amen. Thank you, Josh. Well, let's stand to our feet and sing of our Saviour, our King forever.
Bible reading now, Lynette's going to come up. Good morning, church. Um, so Tony's asked me to do the Bible reading in Tagalog today. So if you happen to speak Tagalog and for some reason are carrying a Filipino Bible, feel free to get that out now. But um, this morning it's in Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. But rest assured, the um, English translation will be up there behind me. So Acts chapter 6. Nang mga araw na patuloy ang pagdami ng mga alagad, nagreklamo na ang mga Helenista laban sa mga Hebreo. Ito ay sa dahil lang na papabayaan ang kanilang mga babaeng balo sa pang-araw-araw na pamamahagi ng ikabubuhay. Tinawag ng labing dalawa ang buong kapulungan ng mga alagad at sinabi, Hindi nararapat na pabayaan namin ang salita ng Diyos upang maglingkod sa mga hapag. Kaya mga kapatid, pumili kayo sa mga kasamahan ninyo ng pitong lalaking kilalang may mabuting pagkatao, puspus ng esperito at ng karunungan at itatalaga namin sila sa tungkuling ito. Habang iuukol namin ang aming sarili sa pananalangin at sa paglilingkod para sa salita. Nasayahan ang buong kapulungan sa kanilang sinabi at pinili nila si Esteban, lalaking puspus ng pananampalataya at ng banan na esperito. Kasama sina Felipe, Procoro, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas at si Nicolas na taga Anchokaya na nahakaya sa Judaismo. Pinatayo sila sa harapan ng mga apostol at sila ipinanalangin ng mga ito at pinatungan ng kamay. Patuloy na lamaganap ang salita ng Diyos at mabilis na dumami ang bilang ng mga alagad sa Jerusalem, kabilang ang maraming pare sa mga naging tagasunod ng pananampalataya. Thank you. The 9 a.m. clap for the net when she did the bar read. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Lynette, for doing that. Um, she told me she was nervous to be uh, speaking to Galo in front of uh, other Filipino friends and family. For all we know, she did a terrible job. But she did great. Um, my name's Tony, I'm the youth director here, um, and gonna be continuing our series in Simon Peter, The Reed and the Rock. Uh, someone said to me the other day, is this series ever going to finish? Um, and rest assured, if that's how you're feeling, this is the second, second to last sermon of 12. Tim Patrick will finish off for us next week. This morning we're finding ourselves in Acts chapter 6, and just give you a bit of a road map of where we're going today. Um, I'm going to spend the first two-thirds looking at the passage, and I'm going to race through it fairly quickly for time's sake. Um, and that'll be quite structural. And then the, the last third of the message, um, that'll be the part that's a little bit ouch. So uh, I recommend you um, text your mum or text, your, text a fr uh, family member or something to give you a call in 25 minutes so you have an excuse to leave. Um, don't actually do that because it'd be good to hear what God's word has to say. Um, the context to Acts chapter 6 is very important. Uh, we're going to spend a few minutes in just in verse 1 and understanding the context and the tension of what's going on here. In these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Now we know from Acts chapter 2, um, that's when Pentecost was, the birth of the new church, um, Acts chapter 2, verse 46 says, All these new believers were coming to the apostles, selling their possessions, and laying it at, at the apostles' feet. And then the apostle, 12 apostles' job was then to distribute it back out amongst the community to those that were in need. Now, one of the groups of people that needed that distribution of food and the care of the Christian community, a group of people that needed it a lot were the widows. Now, when we think widows... The first mental image that comes to our mind is a frail old woman who's lost her husband, um, doing quite well for herself, usually. But that isn't how we should think. Widows back then were often actually quite young women um, because the lifespan for especially men back then was very short. And there was no government payout, there was no Centrelink, 
And so a widow's, a young widow's only choice, if she had a young family at tow, was she had to work for herself and expect the kids to look after themselves, or she'd have to rely on the community of people around her. The other thing we have to understand is there is this hierarchy in Jewish culture. If you were born in the nation of Israel, in Judea and in Jerusalem, you were born and bred into it, you were a Hebrew of Hebrews, you were considered the elite of Jewish culture. And that stigma, that sort of arrogance, did carry over into Christianity as well. And then you've got the Hellenists. Hellenism is Greek culture. So the Hellenist widows are Greek-speaking Jewish people who have come to Jerusalem and ended up coming to Christian. And what most likely happened is their husband had passed away in another part of the Mediterranean world in the Roman Empire, and they've decided to come to Jerusalem because they know that the Jewish culture will care for them, and then they became Christians themselves, and now the, the church is caring for them. So how would you feel if you were a Hebrew widow and you're relying on this distribution of food from the church in order to feed your family, and then you've got these Greek-speaking widows who come and move into Jerusalem and they start stealing, not stealing, but they're taking a part of your distribution of food. When I was eight, um, I went to um, my church's gospel club on Wednesday nights, and you had to be eight to go along. And I remember being so excited for a whole year because I knew that my ninth birthday was going to fall on a Wednesday. Um, and that meant it was going to be gospel club on my birthday. And I was so excited and I was fantasizing and anticipating everyone's going to sing happy birthday to me. It's a typical thing that a lonely homeschooler would fantasize about. <laughs> and my dad, who led that gospel club, who knew that his son was quite egotistical and could do with some humility, I think deliberately overlooked my birthday. Then a couple of weeks go by, and there was this kid called Jake. Now, Jake's a very common name, but when I think of this kid called Jake, it's a dirty word. That brat's birthday was on a Thursday. And what did my dad do? He got everybody to sing happy birthday to him on a Wednesday at Gospel Club. And I remember his smug little face. He didn't have a smug looking face, he just had a face. Like, I just, it felt smug to me. But there was an injustice that had happened to me. I had been overlooked. This was an injustice, and I craved that attention. And I'm sure that you would have had a similar experience where you've been overlooked, where an injustice has been done to you, and you may have been wounded by that. Now, I'm just joking around about, I'd say I'm joking around, but I'm just joking around about this dumb little story when I was a kid and I was craving attention and I missed it. How would you feel if what was at stake was not attention, but food in order to feed your family? See, this is why we need to understand the context of how this tension built and where it came from, where this conflict arose. And this is what brings us to our first point this morning. Conflict inevitably arises in the church. Conflict inevitably arises in the church. Have you ever met a disgruntled Christian who's done with the church? I'm so sick of the church, I can't believe there's so much fighting in it, there's so much conflict, I'm done with it. Take me back to the good old days when the early church was born and there was no conflict. Or the, quite often this is where, nothing against the home church, but this is where that a lot of people who are in the home church movement, it comes from this desire for something more. They're done with Christians per se and they want to do church the right way where there is no conflict. Now the church should be known to be forgiving and be a place of reconciliation, absolutely. It should be inclusive of everybody where nobody is overlooked. But here's the thing. Conflict has always been around. Conflict existed then and it exists now. So the early church is growing here in Acts and the enemy is not happy. He's trying to stop the growth of the church. He's trying to stop the gospel moving forward. So the tactics that he's tried is chapter four, he's done persecution. 
didn't work. The church continued to multiply. Chapter five, he tried to bring sin into the church. Ananias and Sapphira, didn't work. The church continued to multiply. And now he's introducing conflict to try and bring the church down and stop the movement of the gospel. Now, there's this mentality in the church today where we, we kind of see persecution as a good sign. If we're followers of Christ, the world hates Christ, therefore the world's going to hate us. Therefore, persecution is actually a sign that we're doing something right biblically. Same as sin. We actually see that as an opportunity. It's not fun to, to expose sin, but we see it as an opportunity for revival to happen, to be convicted of sin, to repent of it. They're enemies of the... Of, the, of their tactics of the enemy that we actually see as a good sign. So why don't we have that same view on conflict? Who here loves conflict? Any psychos in the room? <laughs> Nobody really loves conflict. And I have to stay, say from the outset, we should never go looking for con conflict. We should never go trying to manufacture conflict for conflict's sake. But it is a tactic of the enemy, and here's a radical idea, we should actually embrace conflict. We should embrace it. Why should we embrace conflict? Well, first of all, it's a sign of spiritual and practical growth. It says, when the disciples were increasing in number, that's when the complaint came up. See, when, if there's no conflict, that would probably be a sign that the church isn't growing. It's a good problem to have. A growing church means more brokenness in the room together, more, more hostility, more counter views. There's going to be conflict, and it's actually a sign of growth. And we're not a huge church here. But we're a big enough church that it's very likely you've been overlooked. And if you've ever been overlooked, you've ever been forgotten about, I, I want to say sorry, and I relate to how you feel. Me and my wife had a very similar experience when we first came here. It took us a good six months to be integrated into the church. And it takes, it takes effort from both parties to get into the life of a church. But it's actually a problem as a sign of growth. Another sign... Uh, another reason why we should embrace conflict is because it's the sign of cultural diversity. You know, this is why I, I asked Lynette to do the Bible reading this morning in another language. Uh, not because I'm biased and she's a youth leader, but the thing that we should actually be doing is we should actually be uh, embracing the fact we have cultural diversity. The, the temptation for the apostles here could very likely be, oh, those Hellenist widows. This, don't they know how good they've got it? We're giving them free food, and it's never good enough. Or they could be like, oh, these Hebrew widows. They're so self-righteous and so arrogant. But whenever a cultural tension comes up, we shouldn't have the perspective that it's just a problem to solve. Now, it is something that we need to address, yes. But our perspective should first and foremost be, this is something to celebrate. Cultural diversity is something to celebrate because it is God's word being fulfilled. This passage is God's word being fulfilled. Greek-speaking Jews, Greek-speaking Christians, and Hebrew Christians are coming together. And we are getting a picture of that in this room this morning with all the different cultures, all the different ethnicities that we have in the room in, our, in the life of our church is something that we should celebrate because it is God's word being fulfilled that one day every tongue, every nation, every tribe is going to confess that he is Lord and that we're going to be worshipping him together for all eternity. So when the church grows, naturally there's going to be cultural diversity. And if there's no conflict ever, we should probably be a little bit worried because that would mean either we're not growing in number or there's too many of us the same. We should also embrace conflict because it's a sign of where expectations really lie. Now, the Hellenists, there's a problem, and they come and they bring this complaint to the apostles. 
And it kind of proves where their expectations lie. Apostles do something. Leaders of the church, elders, pastors do something. You know, we can do this ourselves. When there's a problem, what do we do first? We take it high up. They did, they did the right thing. They didn't do the wrong thing. What else could have they done? But what this does is it actually proves where our expectations really lie. And out of that comes these new opportunities which we're about to unpack that empowers the whole church. Now, you might read Acts chapter 6 and think, what lesson is there in there for us? Um, It looks like, on face value, it's an administrative problem with an administrative solution. But this is where we need to look at the gospel. I feel like this passage proves to us that the gospel calls us to serve one another. Now, you might be thinking, the apostles are pretty arrogant to be like, oh, you know, we're up here. We're, we're going to devote ourselves to prayer and to the preaching of God's word. Um, hospitality, serving tables, that's down here. That's, that's not for us. Or they, this complaint came to them and the apostles had a quick meeting. They're like, look, I am not dealing with those Hebrew widows. All right, I've got enough on my plate. Let's give it to some lower lay members of the church. And this passage has been misused before, almost to infer that the preachers of God's word, the pastors and elders, they're not, they, they don't need to be involved in hospitality and humbly serving one another. But that's not what's happening here. What's happening here is everyone is aware of their gifts and that the gospel calls us to serve one another to our gifts, culturally, practically, and spiritually. We look at the names. Look at these names in verse 5. We've got um, Prochorus, Nicanor, Parmenas, and Nicolaj. No, it's Nicolaj. Some people get that. He's a proselyte of Antioch. That means that he was a Jew, but then he became, sorry, he was a Gentile, and he became a proselyte. Now he is a Jew. Now he's obviously a Christian. Culturally, these guys were up to the task. They were culturally sensitive to the task. Task. So we've got three, uh, four Hellenist names and three Hebrew names. So these guys were culturally set. They were competent at the job. Practically, we see that the apostles, they're gifting. Predominantly, these guys were fishers, uh, um, fishermen. Um, they were blue-collar, hard-working guys. Hospitality isn't their gift. Preaching God's word and to being devoted to prayer is their gift. That's their practical gifting. But also spiritually, they're all working to their gifts. Not only are the, the apostles, the guys that are doing the spiritual job, prayer and, 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 and preaching God's word, also they say the criteria for these men that you're going to choose, they have to be full of the spirit. And it says that Stephen is full of the spirit. These are also people of character. That's the criteria for the job. The gospel calls us to serve one another, and that empowers the whole church. Now, I know that some people would be like, oh yeah, I feel so empowered waiting on tables. But here's the thing. Look at some of these names, and we'll see that, yeah, they had humble beginnings at serving tables, but they actually ended up being gospel workers themselves. Philip became the first evangelist to the African nation, converting the Ethiopian eunuch. Stephen, continue to read chapter 6 and chapter 7. We'll see that um, he became the first martyr of the Christian faith. And who, who knew that Timon's humble beginnings began in the early church in Acts chapter 6, and that he'd go on to plant churches and pastor us here at Oakton for 12 years? This was an opportunity, another open door for them to share the gospel as well. It did empower the church. It did empower each member. The gospel calls us to serve one another and to be on the same mission. Now, you might think these are two completely different jobs, preaching the word, devoted to prayer, and waiting on tables. Like, they're two different roles. But they're actually both on the same mission. They're both on a gospel mission. And that's proved in verse 7. Because of this decision that they made, this administrative decision they did with discernment and wisdom, it says that the word of God continued to increase. 
and the number of disciples multiplied a little bit. No, they multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Because of this decision, delegating roles to their gifts, spiritually, practically, and culturally, the gospel moved forward. They were all on the same mission. And we need to remember that the, that the church is primarily not a social agency, but a gospel agency. I think the world gets this very wrong. They think we're just like any other charity, maybe. We're not a social agency, but a gospel agency. We still have a massive role in feeding the poor and caring for the poor and needy. That's a massive thing, because if there's no physical food for the soul, then spiritual food does no good. But primarily, we're all on the same mission, that is sharing the gospel and letting the gospel move forward. So are you with me thus far? Conflict inevitably arises in the church, and what should we do about it? should embrace it. And the gospel calls us to serve one another. Now this is the the part of the message that might get a little bit interesting. The gospel calls us to serve one another and to walk humbly in conflict. Now you might, may or may not have noticed that this is a series in Simon Peter, the Reed and the Rock. Um, And I haven't mentioned his name once. He's obviously in the 12 apostles, but he's not mentioned by name. And I, I, went, I saw the preaching schedule when I, when I was preaching, and I saw the passage, and I went to Graham and I said, what do you want me to do? Because it's not only is he not mentioned here, he's also not in the commentaries on this passage. But what we can, what we can do this morning is we can look at this passage and this story through the lens of Peter through the lens of Peter. Think of the journey we've been on over the previous 10 messages we've heard about him. Think about Peter on either side of Jesus' death and resurrection, the Peter of the Gospels and the Peter of Acts and the Epistles. What was Peter like in the Gospels before Jesus' death and resurrection? He did things. He didn't think about things, he just did it. He said things. As soon as whatever came to his mind, he said it. He suffered with chronic foot and mouth disease. Think about Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus, Moses, and Elijah there. And Peter, so overwhelmed, just starts blabbering nonsense. Like, Jesus, let's just build a tent for you, Moses, and Elijah, and we're going to stay up here. Or when Peter sees the resurrected Jesus on the shore, and Peter's in the boat, what does Peter do? He grabs a cloak and puts that on first, then jumps in the water. Not the brightest or sharpest tool in the shed was Peter. He was always competitive. Always disciples were constantly um, bantering with one another. Bantering is a light word. They were serious about it. Who's going to be Jesus' two I see? Who's going to sit at his right hand when he takes the kingdom? Competing with John on the way to the tomb. John outruns uh, Peter on the way to the empty tomb, and John can't go in, but Peter just barges through. See, Peter always had to be in control, and he was proud. Only Peter, after just announcing that Jesus is the Messiah, and Jesus then says, My purpose here is to suffer and die. Only Peter would pull the Son of God aside and give him a talking to. Just hang on a second, fellow disciples, I need to talk to Jesus. And he rebukes Jesus and says, you don't know what you're talking about. Keep your mouth shut. Only Peter had the audacity to do that. Only Peter would act like that. Because with Peter, stress equals emotions. When he came up against stress, stressful situations, tense situations, when he came up against conflict, he acted on his emotions and he acted on his impulses. But there's something very different about Act 6. And I think the fact that his name isn't even mentioned is actually quite significant. What's different? I think the old Peter would have been like, when this accusation came against, it was a complaint, and it's almost as if the finger's pointing at the apostles. It's your fault that the Hellenist widows aren't being fed. 
the old Peter could have put up his defenses and acted on emotions and started blabbering, just running his mouth. Or because Peter always wanted to take control and just do things, he could have been like, okay, all right, I'll look after it. And he would have um, not made preaching God's word a priority and then looked after the waiting on tables. Old Peter barged into conflict and cut off ears. Old Peter also would avoid conflict and instead of being there for his friend who was on trial, would instead warm his hands by the fire, claiming he didn't even know that friend. Old Peter was competitive, had to take control. He was proud, emotional, and completely not aware of his gifts and his place. But this Peter of Acts 6, he's happy to empower others, happy to take a back seat, happy to surrender control. He is humble, not driven by his emotions, and he's very self-aware of his gifts and calling. What changed? What changed between the old Peter and the Peter we see here? Well, I think after Jesus saw the Son of God, his best friend, die on a cross and be resurrected again, I think he had a different perspective of conflict. And he thought of his saviour when he came up against conflict. These are his words in 1 Peter chapter 2. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And I think this is the the key here. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to, to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. I have a question for you this morning. How are you approaching conflict? We've already said that conflict is inevitable, even in the church, sometimes especially in the church. So we're all going to face conflict. How do you walk into conflict? I'm going to ask to do something a little bit different this morning. I'm going to ask you to just to close your eyes. Just to close your eyes and I want you to picture the face of someone that you've got conflict with. Someone that wounded you. Someone that has done an injustice to you. You've been overlooked. That person may not know you've got conflict with them. Maybe they've got a conflict with you. But as you picture that face, or maybe it's a group of faces, let me ask, are you driven by your emotions in that conflict? Are you driven by your pride in the decisions you make? How is the gospel shaping you in that conflict? How has Christ's sacrifice on the cross for you changed how you approach your relationship with that person? Are you avoiding conflict with that person? Or are you barging into conflict and running your mouth and emotions? Feel free to open your eyes if you like. See, what what would have happened if the old Peter acted out in Acts 6, if he did try to take control, if he did run his mouth, well, it would have been a disaster because the gospel wouldn't have moved forward. And the the apostles, they didn't do this in this, this instance. Peter didn't do that in this instance, except they used conflict as a gift to drive them to their knees. And conflict can be a gift to us to drive us to our knees that reminds us of how wonderful our Saviour is, 
that causes us to call out for wisdom. James 1.5 says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God and he will give it to all men liberally. Dealing with conflict well can drive the gospel forward. Dealing with conflict well can drive the gospel forward. But unresolved conflict will stop the gospel from moving forward. Let me ask you this morning, City Reach Oakton, do you want to see revival? Do you want to see the gospel take hold of this city? Yes? It's not very convincing. You want to see revival and see the gospel take hold of this city? Yes? Yes. Do you want to see loved ones that you know, who you know that are headed to an eternity without Christ? Do you want to see them know Christ? Yes? Do you really? Do you have any unresolved conflict in your life? Because I would say, based on this passage, unresolved conflict is what's stopping the gospel from moving forward. This passage proves to us that if you want to see the gospel move forward, then we have to walk into conflict wisely and boldly and humbly. And revival begins in our hearts, the individual. And the Holy Spirit cannot move in hardened hearts. And so I'd ask you, is your heart hardened through conflict? because of something that's been done to you, something you've been accused of. Unbelievers, those of you who don't call yourself a Christian, it might be bold of me to say this, but I think it's true. For you, I feel like conflict is a hopeless situation, because what is there outside of that conflict? And let me tell you this morning that the gospel is calling you to a message of hope and reconciliation that Jesus is calling you to accept his sacrifice for you and to give you hope outside of your hopeless conflict. As Jesus' love and shed blood for you is greater than your wounds, his wounds can heal your wounds. And believers, is there someone you need to confess to? Is there someone you need to be reconciled with? Even right now, you know, before the message closes and we sing a song and then we start to talk and then we go out to our car and we forget about what we heard about this morning, is that person that you pictured before, is there someone that you need to pick up your phone right now and text, hey, can we catch up? And you don't know what that's going to entail, you don't know how that conversation is going to go, but you know that this conflict needs to be resolved. Because our conflict could be stopping the gospel from moving forward. Maybe someone hurt you, and that's the the reason for your conflict. Maybe you've been overlooked and you're wounded. But don't expect the person who wounded you to heal your wounds, because it is Christ's wounds that heal our wounds. He is the one that acts justly. Let me invite, invite the band back up to close us out. And we're going to sing a song um, that's very countercultural. It's a song that I think we've talked about this already, that what was happening in the early church is the enemy was trying to introduce this conflict to bring the church down. And what this song is saying is that this isn't our battle, it's God's battle. There's more going on than just you and your conflict, you and the other person. Because what's, trying to, what's, what's happening is the enemy is trying to stop the gospel moving forward and God is trying to push the gospel forward. And this song is acknowledging that this is God's battle, not just your own. And there's a line in it particularly that says, when I fight, I'll fight on my knees. And it's an image of surrender that says, you know, I'm not going to be like the old Peter and act on my emotions and act on my impulses. I'm going to be humble and penitent towards God. I'm going to let him fight the battle for me. Maybe you need to confess that you haven't been doing conflict well and to acknowledge that this is God's battle. 
But this song is a declaration to say, I'm surrendered. And I think this could sum up really beautifully what happened to Peter. We, we wonder what happened to Peter between the Gospels and Acts. And I'd put to you this. Peter all of a sudden realized it's not about Peter. It's not about me anymore. You know, I don't have to be fighting for number one spot. I don't have to let my emotions and my pride drive me anymore. What Peter came to realize is it's not about him. It's about Christ. It's about his gospel. Moving forward and reaching the world, reaching the people that I love. And I think we all need to acknowledge that. that It's not about us. It's about him and his gospel. And maybe it's our pride. Maybe there's something blocking the gospel moving forward in the people's, people that mean the most to us. Let, these, let the words of this song really penetrate your heart and let it be a moment between you and God. Well, thank you, Tony. Let's stand to our feet and let's uh, sing this song together.
wonder if that's something that you can stand here and declare this morning with conviction that the battle does belong to God. So often it's easy for us to think that we can do it on our own, that we want to try and resolve the problem on our own, that we think we've got the conflict in control, that we can do it ourselves. But the truth is that the battle belongs to God. And this morning you may have reflected on a conflict you're in the midst of. You feel like you're in the battle as we speak and you're not really sure what the way out is or you just feel like you you have no solution at all. Well, we're here to tell you that the battle belongs to God. Or maybe you have just recently had a conflict and you feel like it's over and done with, but you can reflect back and think, yeah, maybe I didn't handle that the way God wanted me to handle that. Maybe I wasn't as humble as I could have been or maybe I tried to exercise my my right to be right. And maybe you reflect back on that and think, maybe there is something that I need to apologize for. Maybe I need to say sorry to that person or maybe I need to say sorry to God for how I dealt with that situation. Well, if you're in any of those situations or any other situation that you need prayer for, we would love for you to come down the front after the service so that we can pray with you, so that we can help you bring that battle to God so that He can fight it for you. You don't have to fight it alone. We also want to remind you that PVC is coming up on the 19th in a week's time, so make sure you don't miss that. That's going to be a great time of community, of prayer. We'll have some worship and just sharing the vision of where our church is heading. And we also have Tim Patrick speaking next week in our Sunday service who's going to close the the Peter series for us as well. So go, have a blessed week. We thank you for coming. And just if you would like prayer, please come down the front. We'd love to pray with you. Thank you. So